With some simple tools, you can make, well, this. This is all made directly in Unreal using a basic stencil for each one and convert them into absolutely normal static meshes that you can just use. Now the designs I have chosen are kind of fun, but you can use this for actual logos you need to put on buildings or intricate designs that you want embossed from a wall or something. You just need to put in a stencil, get this result. Now, how do we do that? Let me show you exactly how it's set up. To get started, go under edit plugins and you wanna make sure geometry script is turned on by searching geometry script. Make sure that is checked on and restart your engine if needed. Once we have done that, we can go ahead and get started. Just go ahead and right click and create yourselves a blueprint class. We're gonna want not a type actor this time. We wanna go under all classes and we're gonna search for generated. And then what we want is this generated dynamic mesh actor under dynamic mesh actor. This one right here, we want to go ahead and select it and we'll just call it something like BP stencil to geo. And then I'll open it up. Now this is the way all geometry scripting works. This is the very base. Instead of making an actor, you have to make this and then you can use a specific event that will actually run everything for you. So in the event graph, we do not need any of these three basic ones. The one we need is event on rebuild generated mesh, which you get right when you type in event on. It is this one right here, which gives you a target mesh and of course the execution. So first things first, what do we want? Well, we're going to be using stencils, which means we need to extrude them. For that, we're gonna need a plane. So from the target mesh, I'll just drag out and I'm just going to append rectangle X, Y. Now you could also append a round rectangle. There's a bunch of different shapes, but for this tool, we want a regular rectangle X, Y. Now we have some options here. We have the dimensions, we have the depth, which is basically the amount of divisions, and we have the transform. So we can leave this all by default. If I drag out of primitive options and search for make, you can see we have a few more options here. We can flip orientation, change the UV type, etc. But we don't need this. This is all good by default. So we'll leave it be. What we do want, though, is to be able to set the dimensions and the subdivisions. So here on the left, I'm going to add ourselves a new variable. This is going to be size, where we want to specify the size of this rectangle. And we're going to change it to a vector. We'll make sure it is exposed and I'll add one more. This is going to be our subdivisions. And instead of vector, it is going to be of a type integer and it is also going to be exposed. Now I'm going to compile it. For the subdivisions, by default, I'm going to tell it subdivide 100 times. I want 100 subdivisions by default on this plane. We're going to be displacing it basically. So we want to have a good amount of Topology. And for the size, we'll make it a default plane. So 100 by 100. Now the Z is going to be how much we're extruding it, the thickness of it. So instead of putting it 100, which can be very thick, I'll make it something like 10 by default. We'll of course be able to control this. So this is good enough for now. Then all we need to do is take our size, drag it out, and I'll hold control to get the get node. I'm going to right click and split it. And then I can plug in X into X, Y into Y. And then for our steps width and height, I'm going to grab our subdivisions. And instead of plugging them in directly, I'm going to add one to it. It's a basic add one here. And I'm going to plug that into steps width and steps height. When you have, for example, three subdivisions, you actually have two sets of polygons. There's one division in the middle. So when you have five, you'll have four, which is why I'm just adding one. So the amount of subdivisions for me, makes more sense that way. So if I put in two, I will see two lines of polys. But otherwise, this is not a required step. So now we want a texture, right? Because we need to extrude something. Well, how do we do that? We're going to drag out of target mesh and search for apply displacement from texture map. You can have a node for that, which is great. And it takes a texture. So I'm going to right click on this texture and promote it to a variable. I can leave it called texture. I'm going to right click on it and then convert it to a validated gift. Because basically, I don't want to actually do anything if it is not valid. If we don't have a valid stencil in here, then please don't do anything. Now texture goes to texture, but we also want a few more options here. So for options, I'm going to right click and split struct pin, which will give us things like the magnitude which we want because that is how much it is being displaced. I'm going to take the size and I'm going to duplicate it over here and just grab the Z, which like I said, is basically how much we're displacing it. So the Z magnitude is going in here. We can leave the UV scale here, offset, etc. If you wanted to, you could absolutely set it up so you can tile it. So you can have a tiling displacement. So you can create a simple pattern piece tile it as many times as you want, and then extrude the entire thing all in one go. So you have a lot of controls within the options here. I'm just setting up a very basic one to get you guys started. The one thing I do want to make a variable for, though, is the image channel. 
So I'm gonna right click and promote to a variable and I'll just rename it to just texture channel. And then I'll make sure it is exposed and that the texture also is exposed. And for convenience, I'm gonna put texture and texture channel in a category called texture. Now you can call this a stencil, you call it an image. I'm calling it a texture purely because the file type is a texture 2D. So at this point we can already try it out and see what we get. So if I drag out this stencil, you can see immediately we get this plane, which is great. Now it has a default material on it. We can, of course, change this. If I just search, for example, for basic, we can grab the same kind of orange I was using in the other ones. So we can overwrite the material to preview it with whatever material we'd like. If I want to, I can get a nice metal, etc. But here we have the texture and texture channel. So I'm gonna go into my stencils and I'm going to grab this stencil B. I'm gonna plug it in. And immediately you can see, well, we have a stencil here. Now, because of our subdivisions, it is not very detailed. I'll go ahead and move it up so you can really see the bottom, but it is being pushed in. Now it's being pushed in because in my case, this stencil is white on the outside and black on the inside. So it's being pushed in, but that's okay. If I want it to be pushed out, all we need to do is change the size here to minus 10. And now it is being pushed out by 10 units. So that's great. Now it is not high enough resolution clearly. So I'm going to change the subdivisions for 100 to 1000. And all of a sudden you can see it is looking a lot nicer. Now, one thing that is slightly a problem is these edges. They're very sharp. It causes a lot of artifacts. So what I wanna do is I wanna give an option to slightly smooth everything. So back in our graph, after apply displace from texture map, I'm going to drag out and I'm gonna search for iterative smoothing to mesh, apply iterative smoothing to mesh. And here we can once again, right click on the options and split it. And we have the options for the number of iterations. So I'm gonna right click on it, promote to variable, and I'm gonna rename it to smoothing iterations, and I'm going to expose it. Keep in mind that if you have something in the world, like I have right now, when you hit compile, it will run this again. But as you can see now, it is a little bit smoother. You can see the bottom here is not quite as bad. It is a lot less jaggedy, but of course I can change the smoothing iterations now to let's say 20 and it'll smooth out a little bit more. And now it's a lot smoother on top and smoother on the bottom here. Now, of course, if you push this way too high, you'll need a little more resolution to make sure it doesn't destroy the shape entirely. But the main thing is you have control for it right now. The one thing I don't like though, is the pivot point is in the middle. So as you can see, it is being extruded both up and down effectively, leaving the pivot point in the middle. And I don't want that. I want the pivot point to be at the bottom, right? So if I made this, for example, negative 20, you'll see it is pushed up and down. Now to do that is very simple. After our iterative smoothing mesh, we're going to use a translate mesh. We're just gonna move it up. Or in the cases of us using negative values, it's gonna move it down, whatever direction it needs to go. So for translation, I'm gonna right click, I'm gonna split it. Then I'm gonna get our size one more time. I'm going to split our size and our size Z, we wanna move it up only by half because the point is right now is in the middle. So I'm gonna let go and search for divide. And we're gonna divide this value by two and we're gonna plug this into translate Z. So now you can see the pivot point is where the original thing was. And now it's pushed everything down that I needed to. And if I go ahead and make it positive, the pivot point hasn't moved, but it's pushed the things it wanted up. So you now you get kind of this result. So we're getting there. But the main problem with this is we still have all of this area around it. I don't want this area. This is excess stuff. We want just the stencil. So after this translate mesh, we're going to use a plane cut. So under booleans, you see apply mesh plane cut. We'll go ahead and select it. We're gonna split the cut frame transform to get all the different sections here. And we're gonna need to do a little bit of a math here. So I'll just drag it out a little bit to the right. So we have a little more access to it. Once again, I'm gonna grab the size and I'm going to split it. So we have access to size Z and we want to position the plane based off of whether it is scaling it up or down. So from this cut frame location, I'm gonna right click and go split. So we have cut frame location Z exposed here. And then from here, I'm gonna drag out. I search for select. Then you do select float or just a regular select. Either one is fine because all we need to do is from the size Z, drag out and search for less than. And if it is less than zero, so if it is negative, that goes into the index here, then it is going to use size Z. Otherwise, if it's false, it is just going to use zero. But what if it chooses a bad place? You don't like it, or you want to customize where you want the cut to go? Well, from here, we can just go ahead and add a different value for an offset. So we'll use an add node, and then I'm going to right click, promote to variable, and this is just going to be our slice offset. And that is going to go into the cut frame location Z. 
Now this slice offset will be zero by default, which is great. And we wanna make sure this slice offset, of course, is exposed. You might think, oh great, we're gonna cut it, but where did everything go? Well, our slice offset right now is zero. If I move it up, let's say five units, oh, well now we have something back. What it's doing is it's cutting out that slice and removing everything in the direction of that normal of the plane, which means it is removing everything above. I kind of want to remove everything below, but I also like the fact that we can cut things above. So to give it the option of doing either one, from this rotation, I'm going to drag out and search for select one more time. I'll do select rotator. I'm going to right click and promote to a variable. And I'm going to rename it to invert slice. So if we do an invert slice, it'll pick A, otherwise it'll pick B. So when it is true, I want it to be zeros. And when it is false, I just want to rotate the plane 180 degrees upside down in the x-axis. And of course, we want to make sure it is exposed. And just like that, you can already see we have the right design and it is cutting out from the right area. And if we wanted to, we can go ahead and just select invert slice and it'll get the opposite. Now, if we have inverse slice turned off and I put it at zero, it is only going to remove that perfectly bottom plane. Now, because we have smoothed it as much as we did, we have this like extra little section here which is why the slice offset is quite nice. You can move it up, let's say two units. And now we have a much nicer, cleaner cut here. Now there is one other thing I wanna do in here, which is under the options, I'm gonna drag out, I search for make, for make geometry script mesh plane. And it has the option here for fill holes. I want to have that as a controllable thing. So I'm gonna right click on it, promote to variable. I'll just leave it as fill holes, that is fine. I'll have it exposed. And all of these slice variables, I'm just gonna put into a slicing group. And the others we're just going to put into a mesh group to make it a little bit organized. I'll put mesh all the way at the top, no texture, and then slicing. Now, before we finish up with this graph, there's one other thing that I like to do just at the end, which is drag out of target mesh and just search for repair. And I like to do repair mesh to generate geometry. So if for whatever reason, there is some problems with the mesh geometry, it will go ahead and fix it. But there we go. Now we have a nice little stencil maker. Now here's the thing though. This is great, but I don't want it live. I want meshes. I want regular static meshes that just now populate in anything in PCG, in the world, whatever I'd like. I want meshes, not this graph. So how do we get it to be a mesh? It's actually pretty simple. And we can actually just create a function that does it for us. So all we need to do is create a new function and I'm gonna call it save static mesh. And while it is still selected, here on the right, I'm going to turn on call in editor, which effectively makes it a button in the detail panel, we just click. So now what do we do? Well, first thing is we need this dynamic mesh component. So I'm going to drag it out. And from here, I'm going to search for get dynamic mesh and I'm going to plug that in. So we're going to get the dynamic mesh from the dynamic mesh component, which is everything that's done so far. And then we want to copy this dynamic mesh onto a static mesh. So I'm going to drag out and search for copy mesh to static mesh, which copies this dynamic mesh onto a static mesh. We have not specified what static mesh asset yet. So let's go ahead, right click, promote to variable. I'm going to set it to be static mesh. That's just going to be the name for it. Of course, make it exposed as a variable. And in the category here, I'll put it under baking. And then in the save static mesh, the actual function, I will also put that under category baking. So both of them are kind of together. Now, we only want to do this if the static mesh is actually set and we're good. So to make sure that it's all good, I'm going to drag this a little to the left, right click on static mesh, convert to a validated get, and then I'm going to say, if it is valid, go ahead and just copy onto it, and then we're good to go. So what this would do is if you specify static mesh, it will overwrite the static mesh. This might be good enough for you, but I want to make it so if I don't specify static mesh, let's say I have a brand new project, I don't have a static mesh that I would like to overwrite, I'm not, I don't have a static mesh I just duplicate and just rename to use for this. It's kind of a hassle. I wanted to just create a static mesh right in the content browser. Well, we can do that. If it is not valid, if we have nothing plugged in, we're going to drag out of this get dynamic mesh one more time. And we're going to search for create new static mesh asset from mesh. And that is going to go in here if it is not valid. And then once it does this, well, I wanted to set the static mesh as the static mesh asset if it is successful. So that way, the next time it does it, it'll just go ahead and overwrite the mesh. It'll be set. So this is great. This works, but we need to specify a path. Now, where do we want to save it? I'm going to save it in the root directory. So for that, I'm going to do forward slash game forward slash. That will put it in the content drawer. So this content folder here, this is actually game folder. It is not content. At this point, I'll just give it a name. I'll just call it baked stencil. So I'll go ahead and create a mesh called baked stencil in the game folder. Now, when you save this, you do have a lot of options. 
So I can drag out of options and search for make, and it'll give me the make node for this struct. And you can see there's quite a few options here. For example, enable recompute normals, enable recompute tangent. I'll go ahead and turn the, both of those on for it to recompute that as it needs to. We can even enable nanite and turn on nanite settings here automatically. We can turn on collisions. I will leave this just like that. You can, of course, expose these to have even more control. But now we can go back to our actual environment and we can take a look at the right. We see mesh, we have texture, we have slicing. Oh, wait, where is our baking section? Well, that's not here. Physics is next. And then collision, then dynamic mesh actor. And if I keep scrolling down, eventually I will get to the baking section. And you can tell it's there because there's our safe static mesh button and there's our static mesh input. Now, why is it all the way down here? I don't know. I also want it to be near all my other custom things. But when you put a function in a group, that group goes all the way down. Unlike everything else that stays up where all your variables are. So unfortunately, that's just the way it is. I just know it is there. It is just further down. With nothing set here, I can just go ahead and click save static mesh. And as you see, it has populated the static mesh. It is right here. Big stencil. And you can see here in the content browser, we have a baked stencil, the static mesh. And if I open it up, you can see it is right here in all its glory. And you could absolutely depolish this directly in geometry scripting. You can re-UV it. The one thing though is for the UVs and the remeshing is you can do it, but if you're doing very intricate stuff, like this peacock, for example, it starts to fall apart at some of these points unless you crank up the settings. So just keep that in mind. And I find that the auto UVs are still not very good for things like this, where it has a lot of intricate pieces. So if you want to go ahead and, for example, re-UV it, it might be better to do it outside of here in a program like Maya or Blender. But that all depends on kind of your use case and the kind of shapes you're doing. If you're doing more geometric ones, the auto UV stuff will be just fine. But because this is now a static mesh, I can just drag the static mesh out. So there's the actual static mesh. And if I go ahead and select this, because the baked stencil is still in here, if I make changes, it will update once I do save static mesh again. So if, for example, I want to be a little thicker, I'm going to do minus 20. And now you can see it is a thicker shape. And then I scroll down back to this baking section and click save static mesh. It will overwrite that mesh. As you can see, it is now thicker here as well. Or if I want to, I can make it really thin like this and just update it directly. So if you want to make more stencils and you already have one created, you could just duplicate it and just name it to like new stencil and then plug this new stencil into your static mesh here. And then next time it will go ahead and overwrite this static mesh instead of the original one. But of course, if it is empty, it will create one for you. But that's how you're able to do these really cool, intricate designs directly in Unreal and have a lot of fun getting kind of real geometric embossing where you need it. And of course, depending on the resolution you need, it might be expensive in terms of topology. But if you need something relatively simple, something relatively block your geometric, you can get away with relatively low resolution. But this is the same as you would do with pretty much any displacement. You need the resolution to displace. Now, as always, I'm going to leave the project files to this on my Patreon, where you can join these wonderful people here in supporting what I do. It really means a lot. And if you'd like to join the community, the link to the Discord will be down below as always. And if you're looking for some more awesome tools that I use in Unreal Engine, check out this video right here for some PCG tools I use all the time.